champion women's morning, hashtag speak love. I love speak love. I just got messages while we were sitting here. I thought my little great nephew was born. I'm an auntie again. So those of you who know my Joshua, you know what was so funny when I met Ryan Seacrest on American Idol? I looked at him, and the way he was acting and talking, I was like, he is like a combination of Stetson, Sterling, and Joshua. Like, there was just something about who he was as a person. It felt so, like, familiar, like family, like the way he stood, the way he talked to people, his, just who he was as a person was like my two sons and my nephew, the three boys of the family, like all mixed into one person. It was so cool. So my Joshua, who looks so much like my Sterling, he came and spent every summer with us for years here in Arizona. They would send him from Canada to be with us. And I just love that boy. I love that boy like he's my own. I just, I just love him. And he just became a daddy. And this baby is so sweet. And he's like, I love Sterling. And he named him Lucas. So we now have a Luke and a Lucas. And I bet it won't be before long, years from now, they'll be sending Lucas here for the summer, and Grammy will take care of everybody. Why not? Like, let's do it again. Let's do it again. And we just love Joshua, and um, he's just an amazing young man. I'm just so thankful for the goodness of God, because when my beautiful sister-in-law carried him, her husband left her six weeks after he was born. It was a really devastating time for our family to walk through. Here we are, this family that loves God, and it just doesn't always go easy. And I remember watching an older minister not too long ago on a, online. You know, we had to do everything online because of COVID. And it was an online thing. And he was talking about pastors and ministers. And he said some things that were true. And I didn't want to receive it. I really didn't. But like he said, when you're in the ministry, just expect life not to be easy. Like you're just under attack. He said, a lot of times people will be in ministry and it's like the car blows up kids blow up, the house blows up, your life, everything blows up, and people will go, I thought they were pastors. And he's like, yeah, of course, that's what happens to pastors. And that's why the people around you have to pray for you, and I thank you for that, and uphold you, and declare over you, and stand with you. And when your body breaks down, and things go on, and think your family combusts, and all these things that happen when you're in ministry, you need people to stand with you, not point the finger at you. Because don't forget, when you point the finger, you got three pointing back at yourself. And the ones wagging, it could go either way. Like, come on, people. Like, seriously? And so when that happened to our family with our precious Sharon, we just gathered around her and loved her. And we just raised all the kids with her. And I used to take Joshua swimming, and I'll never forget, Auntie Cindy, watch me. And this little tiny kid would just run and just dump off the diving board and do all these crazy things and land on the water, land on his stomach, land on his head, land on anything. He just was, and I was like, Joshua, where did you learn to do that? He goes, Uncle Jer taught me. And my sister-in-law was smart, and she always had like a young person that she trusted, of course, but she always had like a male in his life that would just do things with him, take him camping, throw him off a diving board. So single mamas, don't you ever feel that you can't do something amazing just because some man left you? Come on now, Auntie Sharon learned to be a good mom and raise those three kids by herself because uh, the, the husband she had really dealt with a lot of uh, emotional issues and a lot of things that went on in his life. And she had to step up to the plate, and we all did, and we all raised those kids. So single mama, stay strong today. There's hope for you. Joshua has turned out to be an amazing young man. Um, he's going to be a phenomenal father. So be encouraged in your heart today. If you feel like I'm a single mom and I can't do it, yes, you can. You can do all things through Christ. And that's why I come to you today behind your screen to remind you and the women who have shown up today, you can do all things through Christ. I've seen it. I've watched it. I've lived 58 years, and I'm telling you what, God is in absolutely everything. He doesn't cause disasters. He doesn't cause he doesn't make things happen to you to, so that, you know, you would show up at the hospital at this point to pray for this person. No, but when you're showing up at the hospital and somebody needs prayer, he's going to arrange you to pray for that person. But he didn't send you there to pray for that person. You just happened to be there when somebody needed you. So you need to adjust your mindset for your father because a lot of us were raised with abusive dads. We were raised with daddies that didn't show us the true love of God. And we then we mirror that back onto God thinking, He's punishing us. He's trying to teach us a lesson. He's a mean daddy. He's got a belt waiting to beat you a good one. That's not the God you serve and love, my beautiful ones. The God you serve and love adores you today. 
So I want to take you over with me. John 15, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that does not bear fruit, while every branch that does not bear fruit he prunes so that it may be even more fruitful. You are already clean. Say that with me again. I am already clean. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he's already paid the price for you. You're already clean. You're not a bad girl. You're not a little girl who who deserves to be smacked upside the head. Come on now. You're already worthy. You're already worth it. And all your mess and all your craziness, like I say in my book, let's get a ring on it, they're still phenomenal, amazing to you. And the biggest trick of the devil is to lie to you about yourself and make you feel bad about who you are and the choices you've made and make you regret your life. And if you would have, and if you could have, and if you'd have married, and if you'd have gone over here, and if you'd moved over there, and if you'd have chose that education, we want to spend and waste our time away feeling like if we could have, should have, would have, and done of. What did my mom used to say? Uh, if, ands, and candies, and butts, or uh, we'd all have a, oh, if, if, and ands were candies and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. She always said that, and I don't know why. If I would have, and if I could have, and well, if I should have, would have, did have. You know what? Absolutely not. You are already clean. In in your Savior, Jesus Christ, you stand under the cross clean. But what happens if I go out and I'm driving down the street and somebody honks at me and I give them the finger on accident? Get over yourself and ask yourself, why did I feel like I had the right to do that to somebody? Like, when was the last time uh, you pulled out in front of someone? Right? I am clean because the word I have spoken to you remain in me. Say, I remain in you, Jesus, as I also remain in you. So I remain in you, Jesus, because you already are remaining in me. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples before the cross. As I also remain in you, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So sometimes it's so easy for us to get so critical of ourselves where we just need to relax and trust God and look at the fruit of our life. And if it's something that's not fruitful, guess what? The gardener is going to take care of it for you. But it doesn't mean it's an evil spank on the hand. When something goes wrong, you don't say, that's just God pruning me. No, God just gently prunes what doesn't bear fruit. So we just have to trust him. Sometimes when things are taken away from us, sometimes when things don't go our way, we just trust God and let God be God. Say, I let God be God. I'm going to let God be God in my life. Jesus said in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withered. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourself that you are mine. How beautiful is that? You know, Pastor Stephen was talking about the rapture coming up. It doesn't matter if you believe rapture before the tribulation, rapture during, or rapture after. They call it post, mid, or trip. It doesn't matter. Jesus is coming back. Sooner or later, girls, he is coming back for his church. He just is. The Bible tells us that no matter when you believe it is, it doesn't matter. But there's a lot of people who are talking about how Revelation talks about the dragon and the lady and all these things. And we didn't realize until we got, like, super high technical, recently, really clear, like, like visions into the stars and how they've all lined up. And if you look at the stars, the stars all line up like the dragon and the woman and the Scorpio and all those. It's like a whole, whole lot. But the bottom line is this. There's a lot of indications that Jesus is coming back very soon. Now, I know I saw the book in my eight, 1988, 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988. And we were walking by. It was 1987. Should we buy that book or not? It was $14.95 a long time ago. That was a lot of money for a little paperback book. A lot of people bought that book. Guess what? We're still here, and Jesus didn't come back in 1988. So there, I'm not giving you any predictions. I'm just telling you this. There's a lot of things that are showing us 
Jesus is coming back. He's going to come back. So I started to think, oh my gosh, is it Jesus coming back? Like, am I going to be raptured? Like, everybody, like, I need to make sure. Like, and Pastor Stephen was so sweet. He goes, honey, if anybody is going to be raptured out of here, you will be the first one to go. I'm like, I don't know. I'm not really for sure about that. Like, I want to make really, really sure. And so I opened up the Word of God, and I always like to read just before uh, Easter time. I like to read about Jesus going to the cross and what he said to his disciples. And just to be strengthened in that moment of why he did what he did for us. And so when I went over to John, all throughout the book of John, and I highly, highly recommend at this time of the year, you read John. Even if you just started in, like, John 13 and went forward to the crucifixion, it's so powerful what Jesus actually says to people, his disciples who love him, and you are his disciples. You're here today. You love Jesus. You want to grow in him. You want to do his will. You want to work out things in your life. Guess what? You're here today. You are one of his disciples. Jesus traveled from town to town and place to place with the 12 and many women. Women were part of Jesus' ministry. The longest recorded like conversation the Bible has is when the when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well. You matter to God. You matter to him greatly as a female, as a woman. You are a woman of God. And so I said to God, okay, like God, like, am I gonna be able to go to heaven? And right when I went to John chapter 13, it says, Jesus began to speak to his disciples and he says, a new command I give you is to love one another. We're called, girls, to love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Hashtag speak love. It's so easy to say, but it's another thing to do. And what happens, so I want to talk to you today about a couple of reasons why you would have the right to pull away and not participate in someone's life or have somebody participate in your life because it's always about love. And I remember when we were planting Faith Christian Center in Canada, we were in the Sheraton Hotel and it was so beautiful and we had like, like we couldn't afford a whole lot. We could afford this beautiful room and the water because they would put the water in the room for free and then they would put all these beautiful glasses and they would stack them all up so beautiful and it was so exciting because we went from the little room to the bigger room to the even bigger room than that. I was like, oh, we're so awesome. We're growing. We're faith Christian center. This is before I got sick. Okay, so I was like a little bit fancy dancy, right? And so we were going up the elevator to go to church, and there was this little couple, and they kind of looked like, I mean this loving, they kind of looked like little bad people. They had fake clothes on, and they didn't smell all that good, and they, their hair wasn't clean. And I was like, oh, they coming for me. I was a young pastor. I'm so amazing. I'm so wonderful. Right. Well, they came to our church. And I loved them. I was like, oh, it's so good to have you. Like, I'm smacking myself. Like, you got to love everybody, Cindy. It doesn't matter who people are in this church. You love everybody. Well, do you know what happened with those two people? They ended up being the most biggest givers you have ever met in your entire life. They would give us, they, they, they came across this Himalayan salt that was supposed to heal your body. Put it in the water. You drink it. You wash your hair. You do. They brought us vats. So many vats in our garage of this salt. Then they decided we needed to have this new blender. So they bought us this blender. I mean, it, it was like they just came into our life. They tied like you wouldn't believe. You know what happened? We went to visit them in White Rock, which is on the beach. They owned a beautiful palatial home that overlooked the beach. And he told us when we went to visit them for lunch one day. It was the most beautiful lunch. It was just. It was like. Are you two? And God was like, I'm teaching you something for these people. You never, ever judge who I bring into your life. You always, always love. Always. He had gotten hurt at work when he had had this massive multi million dollar settlement. And they were praying at this time where do we go to church and where do we go to be a blessing and help? And God brought them to him. And it was one of the biggest lessons I ever learned in ministry is to love absolutely everybody. Some just amazing people, some just people that you don't think have that great of story. You know what? In God's kingdom, everyone deserves to be loved. Everyone. From 
the greatest to the smallest. Everyone deserves to be loved. But sometimes there's some people in our lives, and we need to feel right in our hearts. You know what? It's right for me to pull away from this person. So the first thing I want to talk about is if somebody is abusive to you, it is unexcusable. It's forgivable, but it's unexcusable for you to con yourself into getting back into that situation over and over and over. The average woman will go back to abuse up to seven times before she can finally cut the ties. So if you have a friend in that situation, you don't judge her. You don't tell her, well, she's gone back with him again. She ain't coming to stay with me another time. She may need to come and stay with you six more times before she can finally cut the cords of that abuse. So if someone is hurting you, abusing you, being hateful to you, being rude to you, you do not have to stay in that relationship and feel guilty before God that you're not loving that person. Because you can forgive them, you're going to love them, but you don't have to participate in life with them. Another one is abandonment. When somebody abandons you. Full on abandonment. They just <laughs> abandon you. You love them. Once again, it is inexcusable to ever cut somebody completely out of your life. It's ridiculous. Unless there is abuse and there's something terrible happening. Absolutely. But most of the times when we hear scriptures about love, 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 we sit here and we get guilty about the people who have really hurt us. And we feel like, you know what? We should be loving them. And I feel really bad because I, uh, no, we have to have boundaries in our lives. Group. And it's okay to have those boundaries. When someone has abused you and hurt you or abandoned you, if someone has abandoned you, please listen to me when I tell you they were not meant to be in your life. They just weren't. Otherwise, they would be there right now. Some of us have dads who, who left us at whatever age it was and they haven't affirmed us, they haven't loved us, they haven't acknowledged us, they haven't participated with us, but the Word of God tells us that you have a Father who is the gardener of your life. And if you will lean into God today, and you will trust Him like never before, and you will allow Him to be the Father in your life, you will begin to raise up in your self-esteem. You will begin to raise up in who you see yourself as, because you are no longer of the kingdom. Don't forget, that's one of the last words that Jesus said before he left this earth. This is not my kingdom. This is not my realm. Do with me with what you want. You can flog me today. You can shove crowns, a thorn of crowns into my head. You can hurt me. You can bruise me. You can beat my back. You can do whatever you want to do because I am not of this kingdom. Girls, you are not of this kingdom. People can turn their back on you, hurt you, abuse you, abandon you. You do not have to take it. You are not part of this kingdom. You are part of the kingdom of God. But I want to just challenge you with this. No matter what people have, let me tell you what, I have had flipping pastors in this city, like literally flat out come against me in horrible ways. Pastor Brent and I can tell you, being on the radio station, one calls up live on air and rips a strip off of me so bad. My husband was driving to his office like a maniac. No, he was. And I was praying in tongues, and I was like, no, you're not. No, yes, I am. He was on his way. I didn't know. What was he going to do, punch him? Like, I have no idea what he was going to do. I don't know. But, but, if I were to ever bump into that person in my heart, I have Jesus big enough in me, girls hear me, the true gardener who says, I am already clean, I don't need anybody's affirmation, I know who I am in Jesus, people go, oh, you know, women aren't supposed to do what, are, are you kidding me, do you know, you need to look up Priscilla in the Bible, she was full on running churches, like, we want to go by this, anyways, that's a different topic, the point is, in my heart, I have to have Jesus so big, that if I were to see any frenemy or any enemy or anybody who's abused me, anybody who's hurt me, anybody who's abandoned me, anybody who's left, guess what? You have to have Jesus so big in your heart, you can be nice to them. That's all. Just smile. Hi, I'm at the fair. Just smile. I'm at the mall. Just smile. I'm at Marshall's. Just smile. Wherever you are, you just smile. 
You have to have Jesus big enough that you can be kind enough in the moment and move on. I love that scripture. When you have escaped the sword of the enemy, leave and do not linger. Get away from people who are enemies to you. Get away from I love my father in law because I knew there was somebody in our life and he did not like it. Woo, he did not like it. He would say bad things under his breath when they'd be like another part of the house. He'd be saying bad. I'm like, that's my Papa Bloomfield glory. Whoop glory. Whoop glory. Don't forget, Papa, you love Jesus. Those are bad words. Like, so we're all human, right? But if we ever be nice to them, to their face, and give them affirmation and give them love, he did not let their behavior dictate his response to them. My baby behind the side when they did not know. And he was giving me a little show, too, because he wanted me to know that was the enemy over there. They're not our friends. We just put up with them because of this and that and whatever else. And so he just taught me how to be kind to those who are not kind to you, who have done re- this person had done bad things to our family really bad, but they were part of the family, so we had to love them. And he did. He did. He honored them as Jesus would honor anyone who was nice to them. And that's what I want to challenge you with today. As Jesus calls us to love, as we're part of the vine, as the gardener, and as the one, as God is our gardener, and he's chipping away at the things of our life that aren't supposed to be there, we got to let some of those things go, because sometimes those things don't bear fruit in our and it's okay if they go, hello, little beautiful girl. Look at this little thing looking up at me. I wish you all could see her. She's absolutely adorable. I remember that's little Athena, isn't it? I haven't seen her since she was a newborn. She just looking up at me, like saying amen with her bright eyes. And I also see my two grandsons over there, too. They get to be in here today, the Grammy, hearing Grammy preach. That's my little Luke who said, Grammy, when you get to heaven, you have to talk. My heart can hear you. But my little and my little Zeke, he's just now starting to talk. And he hasn't said too much like that to me yet. He's coming. He does tell me one thing, Grammy, Grammy, I like soda. I like soda. I like soda. Yeah. Today I just want you to be set free to love. We always hear Jesus is coming back. Are you ready? If you're ready, you're loving. You're loving the unlovely. You're loving those who need you the most. You know, that's the thing about bad behavior, isn't it? Think about it. Sometimes people will say to me in leadership, it's not what they say to me, it's how they say it. It's like how they turn their face up and their eyebrows go down and they say it. It's like, oh, unfortunately, I walk with Jesus pretty close and so when people put other people down around me, like, I know what they've been through. I know what they've survived. I know what they've gone through. It's like you see the bigger picture, and it's like you try to help people come to that moment of loving everybody around them. And that has to be something that you do. It has to be something that he helps work out in your life. It has to be forgiveness that flows from the throne room of heaven because Jesus lives so big in you. You can laugh driving down the street thinking, I don't think there's like anything anybody could do to offend me. I can get hurt, but to offend me where I couldn't forgive somebody, I don't think, even if the worst person ever contacted me and said they were sorry, I would be like, oh my gosh, absolutely. Even my old neighbor, Bertha, she's in heaven now, so I can tell you all about her. She was horrible. She was connected to our duplex. Dear Lord Jesus. Not to mention, she was there when I was deathly ill, so here I am, deathly ill, fighting for my life with a neighbor connected to me in the duplex who was, like, horrible. Like, she was just this old, grouchy lady. She was so bad. Finally, thank you, Jesus. We all moved out at some point, or I think I prayed her out. Yeah, she went out before us by several, probably about a year or two or more. So one day I was at the new Walmart, because I prayed Walmart into Canada. I'm like, I'm not living here without a Walmart, Lord Jesus, just like when we moved here. I'm not living here without Starbucks. Thank you for like 20 of them now. But at the time we got here, there was one inside of Barnes and Noble. Didn't open until 10 o'clock. Like, really? Who wants a coffee at 10? I like it like early. Like, whatever. And so there I was in the new Walmart, and I was looking at the shoes, and I turned around, and there's Bertha with her little wig on. Big old Bertha. She goes, I just want you to know I forgive you. I want you to know I forgive you for who you were to me when we lived by each other. And I'm like, who you were? I was so nice to her. 
she does not know, like, I could have been so mean. I could have banged on the wall. I, I know you people were making noises. I'm like, I have two little boys. We were making lots of noises. I'm so sorry. I know you did it to make me angry. She just told me all the things she forgave me for. And I just put my arms out. I'm just, I just, Bertha, I said, thank you for forgiving me. I never would have hurt you. I've been hurt. I would never have hurt you on purpose. Not to mention, Bertha, what? She goes, well, I know. We watched you shrink away. And I was thinking, well, if you were watching me shrink away, why weren't you nicer to me? Like, it doesn't matter. I'm just trying to give to you today with a little bit of knowledge about being part of the vine today. Let God trim some things away, and that's okay. But make sure in your heart you're still loving and you're still able to see the person and extend love to absolutely the worst prisoner. I had somebody recently say to me, oh, you know, so-and-so was in jail, and they were this, and they were that. And I said, yeah, I know. And they're going on and on about the list about how bad this person was. And I was like, yeah, I know. I'm one of the only people who, like, went and visited them. And they were like, what? And I went, oh, yeah, no, I did. I went and visited them, and I would email with them. We were on this email prisoner email thing. And I said, you know what? I'm really called to love me to love me. I don't know why God just put that on my life. I know what they did. It's like, how come I know it? But I'm called to that. That's just, Jesus is too big in me to be this finger pointer. And the person was like, wow, I never thought of it. And then their heart turned and began to kind of see the situation a little differently. Because of the way they were raised, look at what they went through. They're always trying to be something they're not. And it's just who they are as a person. They got busted. They got in trouble. And that's what happened. And there was a price to be paid. But I just want to try to gift you with having Jesus so big, having the vine dresser so big in your life, and realizing how clean and amazing you are, you can give grace to other people. Because you walk in the cleanliness of your Savior, Jesus Christ. Who are you to make your hands muddy around somebody? You're already clean. Reach out into their muddiness and pull them into you and love them regardless if they're asking you for the love. And if they're not, sweetie pie, you just keep on walking because there's somebody just down the way a little bit further who needs your love. I pray for you now in the mighty name of Jesus, those of you who are watching, that God will just fill your heart so much with the love that he has given through his Savior, Jesus Christ, into your life to love you, first of all, unconditionally, and second of all, then, to begin to love others unconditionally. Wherever you're at today, receive God's unconditional love, and he will flood your life with amazing things. And don't feel guilty for cutting people out that are abusing you, who have abandoned you, who continue to hurt you. It's okay. This is not what this is about. Whenever you hear a sermon on love and forgiveness, you sit there and you feel guilty. Not today. Be set free and know that if you were to bump into that person, you could hug them, you could love them, you could help them. If they were on the side of the road, you could stop by and ask them what they might need. But you keep going and you are there for those who need your love, who want your love, because there's people everywhere who need the hand of God in their life. You're that person. So I pray today that God will set you up with some great information. I don't believe in coincidence. Coincidences don't happen. It's always set up. People are everywhere. They're even in your home. It's so easy to say, I'll go down to the mission and I'll do all these things for everybody else. Maybe your mission's right in front of the kitchen of your house where you need to love the people in your home and cook them a beautiful meal or clean up their crazy, messy room or do something amazing for that person. God's calling us to first love at home and then we can look outside of our home and go out and love the world. In Jesus' name, be blessed today. We're so glad you've been with us.